many of you in here have implemented a programming language? How many of you have implemented a, a compiler for a programming language? How many of you have implemented a um, garbage collector for a programming language? The numbers are declining very rapidly. <laughs> How many of you have implemented um, a thread system with synchronization for your programming language? A few of you, okay. Um, and I, I would like to take those numbers as indicative of the, of the difficulties that people face in grasping all of those concepts together. So we'll hope, hopefully address that a bit today. Um, this is the polite version of my talk. Um, so there's a, a polite view of everything. You know, on the street level, things look just fine. Um, but it's when you get below street level that things get a little bit um, trickier. Um, and so this talk actually has an alternative title, uh, Why Languages Suck. Um, I didn't feel... The, the courage to put that on the website, but um, uh, I'll be giving this talk. It's been given uh, a couple times before. Uh, Steve Blackburn, uh, my colleague at the ANU, is one of the people who's given this talk before, and our PhD student has given this talk before with ponies. I'm not going to do ponies with you today. Um, I couldn't quite bring myself to do that either, um, but uh, oh, there's the pony. Um, in fact, this is a hand-drawn pony by one of, my, uh, one of our students. Um, and uh, the person who is doing that is Kun Kunshan Wang. He's the um, uh, PhD student who has been working on the microVM as his um, project and uh, has done most of the definition of the micro virtual machine um, in collaboration with Steve and I. Right, so we all know about programs. We know, do we know what programs mean, what their semantics are? Can we make the computer do what we want, the, want it to? Um, how many of you are familiar with the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? So this is the scene where the machine is supposed to tell us where the Wonka bar is, and of course it, it doesn't provide the answer, and uh, Tim Brooke Taylor here gets quite um, agitated at it. So what could possibly go wrong when programs come along that we think we understand? Oh, awful things can happen. Um, this is the uh, destruction wrought, re wrought by a Scud missile when a Patriot missile failed to intercept uh, because they were using a 24-bit representation of an integer and they'd lost some of, some of the bits and as a result the Patriot missile was seeing time slightly differently than it really was and did not hit the missile that was incoming. All right, so lots of things can go bad. Um, it can be even as bad as uh, the fact that software may actually uh, be a threat to our health. Here's a, an article that says that health software brings risk of death. Confident going into the hospital, aren't we? Well, part of the problem here is that we have programming languages that it's difficult to understand. Here is uh, the um, <laughs> comments with the, the keyword WTF in them from uh, a survey of repos for languages. Um, and our friend at the top there, of course, says C++. Lots of WTF questions about C++. Lua, oh boy, Scala. C sharp, JavaScript, and then on down. So, what's going on? What can we do? Well, let's do a little programming. A little bit of JavaScript for you. What should array plus array be? No, it's empty string, of course. Come on. What, what's array plus object? Is it a type error? No. It's an array of object. Plus is commutative, right? So object array should be easy, shouldn't it? Plus is not commutative in any language. Zero. I think that's worth a WTF. <laughs> okay, something simple. Object plus object. Anyone know? Oh, come on. There's a few JavaScript programmers here, aren't there? Yes, of course. <laughs> it's obvious, right? <laughs> well, okay, so, hmm. Suppose I have an array. 14 things. All right. What do I get? 14 commas. Obvious, right? What's joined it with a string? Foo. Okay, 14 foos. Should we add one to it? Well, it's 
possibly reasonable. What if I subtract one? And add Batman. No, 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 Batman. Okay. So we're all laughing. But this is a little frightening, isn't it? I would like to think that this is a little frightening. Um, it makes us scratch our heads and wonder what the heck is going on. Who and what and why have these languages been designed this way? A little bit of PHP. Okay, anyone want to have a guess of what the output for that is? Anyone, any PHP programmers here? So we're going to print out the string, a, a squared bracket zero. So this is the contents of a sub zero in the, in the array. It's going to be some bonkers, though. Okay, five. Right, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough, because I assigned five to it. Fair enough, great. How does that happen? Well, we have this array, and we stick five in there, and we read out five, and we get five. <laughs> oh, someone knows. All right, how's that happen? Well, there's our array, we put five in it, and we get another array. Because it's value, right? We, we're doing value assignment, and you get five. And there's the documentation. In PHP, variables are always assigned by value. That's to say blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we do the same thing, but there's a slight tweak to this program, of course. We've got that assignment there to B. There's our array A, put five in it, fair enough. A sub zero gets five. What's going to happen? At the point that we assign the B there, we actually get a boxed version of five. Now, C gets A, and we do the same thing, and we get 10. It's brilliant, isn't it? Now you might say to yourself, what the hell's going on here? Please. What if we unset B? <sighs> you get back five. Ah. Uh, so... Let's do a little bit of digging forensics. What's this say? It says, uh, someone's, some, someone's complained about this. Perfectly reasonable complaint, I would think. I create an array and then reference it, it, it to an element of that array. The array is passed to a function by value which changes the value of the element. After that, the global array has another value. I would expect this behavior if I passed the array by reference, but I did, did not. And supposedly, PHP is supposed to be passing by value. All right, actually, there's the quote from that. All right. This bug has a lot to do with bug reports mentioned below. There's a response to this bug report. I'm going to pull up this quote here. We have discussed this issue and it will get up and we'll put a considerable slowdown on PHP's performance to fix this properly. Therefore, this behavior will be documented. <laughs> So it's now become part of the standard for the language. What, what the hell happened here, right? Someone implemented something that they didn't really understand, gave it to programmers to use, who also didn't really understand it, got some surprising behavior, and then they came back and said, oh, well, that's just a revision to the spec in response. And this, of course, leads to all sorts of opportunities, including for academics who like to write papers at Popple, Copy on write in the PHP language. You get a puppet paper out of figuring this mess out. All right, so um, moral of the story here. There are a lot of languages out there that are designed without a lot of thought put into them and where the semantics of the language gets baked in from the first implementation of that language. Is this really the way we want to be doing things? Really? Okay. a little more digging. We 
also worry about performance as programmers. We worry about not only that our programs run fast, but also that they will be correct and do the things that they're supposed to do, that they'll be reliable in the face of different usage patterns. Here's some code. Code in one language. Looks like C to me. Code in another language. Looks like Python to me. What's the performance? Anyone have a guess? Prime number of a number. This number here. <laughs> well, difference, performance difference is both ways, right? So it doesn't matter. 100x, okay. Yeah, it's, back, it's about 25x. For the same program. Does this have to be the case? We would hope not. How many of you have done this? PHP. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What do you get for performance if you do that? Well, it's about 100% improvement. <laughs> Is that really what we want? People to be turning off garbage collection because they get 100% improvement? And this is the comment from the um, PHP manual page. This can be very useful for big projects when you create a lot of objects that should stay in memory. So GC just can't clean them up and just start wasting our CPU time. And that's on the, that's, that's the manual page for that function. <laughs> Sorry? It explains a lot, yeah. Um, you know, there's, 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 yeah, there's a lot going on here. Where there's, there's social things going on here, not just technical things as well. Um, performance, performance. So, you know, take some of the language shootout game benchmarks and uh, look at their performance across the spectrum here, from C++ up to Python. Pretty slow. Similarly, Mandelbrot. Similarly, this benchmark. Perl in this case. What was the one in the previous one? Perl again here at the top end. All right. Is that really is that really the way the world has to be? <laughs> Do we really want that to be the state of play with our languages? Do we choose our languages based on their performance or their ability to express what we're trying to express? Okay. So there's performance. We worry about performance and, and language design influences performance in huge ways and the implementations of those languages influence their performance in huge ways. We also have the reliability question. Facebook goes down in worldwide outage. Okay, so smartphone apps are unable to reach Facebook. Comments from Facebook. Earlier this morning, we experienced an issue that prevented people from posting to Facebook for a brief period of time. We're back to 100%. Sorry for any inconvenience. Well, presumably this was something going on in their system with the languages that they were happen happening to use. Now, um, I don't know what the particular bug was in this particular case, but there's you know some obvious vulnerabilities that some of these languages have. Critical PHP vulnerability exposes servers to data theft or worse. JavaScript allowed to run in the mailbox iOS app. And vulnerabilities exploited in the wild, PHP. And of course, the cost of these sorts of things is formidable. We have not just correctness issues, but performance issues. And uh, the, the cost is huge in terms of maintenance and debugging, performance. Sluggish apps and sluggish and inefficient servers cost our economies. And of course the energy cost that goes into running these languages which are sitting there on servers chewing up electricity bills. As well as on your mobiles. And the question that we've tried to ask and it's motivated some of the work that I'm going to be talking about is why is this the case? Why are we in this situation? Um, what's caused this problem or these problems? Is it because it's too hard? Well, in fact, it actually may be. It may be that we're just facing a situation where it's just too hard to get these things right all in one package of a single package programming language. We've got concepts that are difficult, like concurrency. Concurrency is hard, so let's punt and go for the global interpreter lock. And then 
realize that down the track it's going to be impossible for us to take our language and make it run on multi-core systems. Garbage collection is difficult. Shouldn't be difficult after you've read our book, right, Richard? It's, it's easy. Yeah. And if you think my reference can't be read with the garbage collection, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> but many people believe it's the easiest to implement. And in fact, naive reference counting is what's in PHP, was in PHP. So that's the semantics that we saw was an, out, uh, an outshoot of naive reference counting as the implementation technique. So it's quite the last on the table. Yep. It's too hard, it's difficult to engineer. We get, we get copy on write semantics, so by mistake, so punt and call it, call, it, call it a feature. That it's a feature of the language that it does that. Call that odd semantics a feature. And what's worse is these choices get baked into a language very early in its design. Very early in its design, before when it, becomes, when it becomes obvious that there's a problem, it's too late to fix it in many cases. Language designers are ignorant about things. They don't know what they don't know when they're designing a language, so reference counting seems easy. Cool. If we can use it to implement copy on write, cool. Its performance seems okay in version 0 0.1 of our 0, 0 0.1 of our VM. Developers, developers can deal with cycles. Well, cycles aren't a problem. Come on, who, write, who builds data structures with cycles in them? The programs are going to, we're designing a language for use in small settings, small, small programs. We're not going to have issues with that. And then there's uh, the swamp of naive impl implementation when you don't know how bad you are. Um, ignorance is bliss, right? GC is not a problem for us, we've measured it. 24-byte object headers are okay, we've measured it. <laughs> Incrementing reference counts and decrementing reference counts don't cost much, we measured it. Really? Okay. So I've been deliberately um, uh, provocative here, um, but the question is what's hard and why is this the case and, and can we come up with uh, an analysis of this that will point us in, in directions that we might be able to improve the situation? Okay, so I, I asked at the beginning of the lecture, um, how many have you have implemented a JIT? And think about the, the energy you put into that implementation and thinking hard about it. And I, I would argue it's a, it's a, a JIT is a, a relatively complex piece of software by itself, right? How many of you have worked with concurrent systems? It's, it's a difficult, dealing with concurrency is hard. Thinking about concurrency is hard. It has diverse and widespread impacts across your system. Um, you have to worry about invariants that often have to be thought of in a global sense rather than in a local sense. You cannot just examine a piece of code in isolation. You have to worry about what all the other bits of code in your program are doing simultaneously with that code. Reasoning is difficult. And garbage collection itself is quite difficult. But I would argue that these are the fundamental pieces of any virtual machine that we're building these days. And that the com combination of them, in, in the, the cross product of those, makes it even more difficult to build systems that have taken into account the need for a, a good JIT with concurrency and with a good garbage collector. And we can sort of see this in some of the language designs, right? The way things have been built, C Python, interpreted with a global interpreter lock and naive reference counting. PyPy with a tracing JIT, great, but still has a global interpreter lock. Sorry, Carl. Mm -hmm. and, but it does have a pretty nice collector design, uh, inspired by actually some of Steve's work. Other implementations, Unladen Swallow was a template JIT with a, which had concurrency, same as CPython, uh, and uh, naive reference counting uh, implementation. Jython, bytecode, but running on a JVM, which is good, so you get concurrency and, and a good garbage collector, but you're saddled with having to express things in a language form, Java bytecode, which is not suited necessarily to the language that you're compiling. PHP, it's interpreted. I don't know what they, they there's no real story on concurrency, and it has, again, naive reference counting. Hip hop. Ruby. Perl. Okay, so none of these implementations really has considered all three aspects here in combination in ways that give them a system that truly performs. 
Anyone know what this picture is? It's a famous, famous, famous picture. That's a, that's a marshmallow. <laughs> How, long can this sit? How long can this little boy sit there in a room by himself? He's been left alone with this marshmallow in front of him. He's been told, if you don't eat the marshmallow, I'll give you something even better. Two marshmallows, right. Two marshmallows. And of course, the study shows that young children can't, they just can't resist. It's right there now. One in the hand is better than two in the bush, right? So <laughs> this is the same sort of thing, I think, that goes on with language designers. They, they have a goal of getting a language up and running that they can use, and they sh sh take shortcuts along the way. They're aiming for this, where they chop a bit off here and they chop a bit off there and they chop a bit off here and they chop a bit off there until they're left with not much at all or something that's crippled. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm not being very PC. <laughs> Mario. So I don't know what you want to say. Comment yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. So, so I agree with what you said, but I, 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 don't, I think you'll notice that the, the, the people that didn't raise their hand at the beginning of the thing don't want to over, uh, I don't want to scare them into thinking this is extra, exceptional and difficult. To give you a data point, in the course I taught at Berkeley, we took a small but fairly realistic in language in the sense of the hard parts, and the student built a VM with a copying garbage collector, a JIT, uh, with decent performance, no concurrency, it wasn't concurrent, uh, in about seven weeks. That's actually a chapter I want to see in your book. No, that you're 10, hours, 10 to 15 yeah. hours a week of exercises for a couple of hours of practice. It's not you just have to, be, you have to know what to do. Exactly. Now, the point of the course was, go this way, not that way, because there, are many, right. there so, are many precipices you can follow. Perhaps it's merely a matter of education. Yeah. Um, that's why you need to write that and, book. And, and the real problem is the language designers are the ones who need this education. Yes. Because they are clueless. Yes. For the most part. Yes. Yeah. Right. I don't know how to stop it. There was never any intent to write a programming language. I have absolutely no idea how to write a programming language. I just kept adding the next logical, logical step on the way. Creator of PHP. It obviously is great. Logical? <laughs> well, to him it was logical. It made sense to him. Right? Seemed like a good idea at the time. Right. And then they hit us with PHP. <laughs> right. Okay, so, um, you know, what are the existing approaches? Well, um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of talk in this room about various sorts of virtual machines, LuaJet, PyPy, Java, the big monkey in the room. How did we get to Java? Well, we threw a lot of money at it. And a lot of brains, a lot of smart people worked on it over the years. Cliff's not here anymore, right? Cliff being one of them. Um, it takes some effort. But there are, you know, there's other approaches. You can put JRuby, or you can put Ruby on, on Java. Fine, but there is this horrible gap between the language that you're implementing and the target uh, virtual machine, which drags in everything, including the kitchen sink, that you don't really need for your particular language, perhaps. How many of you have used LLVM? Yeah, okay, so there's LLVM. This was gonna be our saving grace, right? Low level virtual machine. Sounds great, virtual machine. What are they using it for? C. What happens if we tell them to do it for garbage JavaScript? And it's Chris Flatner and, uh, and his former advisor at Illinois. Not necessarily the, the, the designers of LLVM. That's not what they intended it for. And it, it certainly was, well, maybe they did initially. They thought maybe it could be uh, suitable for languages like JavaScript, but it has not become that. So how did we end up here? This is really the question and, and what I'm trying to address here. The other thing I would like to point out, and this is um, something that we've been sort of riding for a long time, is this notion that machines are going to get faster, so it doesn't matter if my programming language is inefficient. I'm going to get a faster machine tomorrow. 
I don't need to spend time being careful to make something efficient. Um, that's, and certainly that's true of Moore's Law, but of course there's this other bugbear in the room, which is the power relationship and the uh, energy, uh, the heat dissipation relationship. Um, Donard scaling has, has actually stopped, and as, as a result our machines are not, in fact, getting faster. Um, so we're now at a point where we actually have to be smarter about how we implement languages to get the performance that we want. We can't just say there'll be another faster machine on the horizon tomorrow. The other thing we have to worry about is the arrival of more heterogeneous platforms. And do we want to be worrying about implementing how we implement a virtual machine for different hardware platforms? Um, is, that really the, is that really where we want to be? And what's the problem when we, what happens when we have managed languages with heterogeneity um, it's, it's still an open question, I think, but um, it's quite likely that we'll have a train wreck um, because we're going to have to have languages that can be run on multiple heterogeneous platforms. Okay, so it's all gloom and doom, right? So just to recap, languages suck. Uh, concurrency in GC and JIT's a headache. Uh, in combination, uh, that in instant gratification and orders of ignorance um, lead to poor designs and that the free lunch is over for performance. Um, heterogeneity is here. Uh, so this, actually I, I, think, I think Steve formulated this talk actually before we'd even started the concept of the work that I'm going to tell you about now. Um, but the, the work that I'm going to tell you about now actually arose out, arose out of conversations about this particular talk um, and what to do. And so we uh, decided that we were going to get together and build what we call a micro virtual machine. Um, the intent here is to provide something that is a, a base for language implementers to actually build upon. And in many respects the goals are very similar to the, those of, uh, of, of um, Graal and um, Truffle, um, but I don't know why I can never remember Truffle. I always say Graal, um, but uh, we have a we have some other different, slightly different goals as well, um, which I'll explain in a minute. Okay, so this is uh, this is work that's um, going on now at uh, the Australian National University, where I'm currently located, uh, with Steve Blackburn and a couple of PhD students, as well as collaborating with Michael Norris, who is at what's known or what was known as NICTA. Uh, in Australia, and also with Elliot Moss at uh, UMass and a couple of his uh, people there as well. And there's funding from several sources, I should acknowledge them, the Australian Government via NICTA, uh, which has now actually been called Data61 as of July 1st, so if you see people from NICTA, they, they will have a different badge on them. Um, and uh, the National Science Foundation is also supporting this work. Okay, so what's a micro-VM? Micro a micro-VM is, 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 the name is intended to give you an ev evocation of uh, micro-kernels. So if you have a monolithic kernel for an uh, operating system, you've got the hardware layer which is abstracted by the operating system with your application up here, and you've got all sorts of stuff in between. System calls and file systems and IPC and scheduling and virtual memory and so on, device drivers and so on. In contrast, a micro-kernel uh, has a very thin veneer over the hardware with very basic uh, resources available, IPC, scheduling, virtual memory, um, and with services or servers, if you like, acting as the, uh, the layer between the application and the microkernel. Um, so if you want to think about this in terms of virtual machines, um, I would say Java is a, a monolithic virtual machine. It has libraries and class loaders and interpreters and threads and JIT and garbage collection. Uh, what we're trying to build is with a micro virtual machine is something much smaller with low level primitives for concurrency and JIT and GC and leaving uh, the layer between the application and the micro VM as a, an adaptation layer that client languages can, uh, will have to implement above the services that we provide at this level. So there'll be client libraries like Java libraries say and concurrency abstractions that will, will be built out of the primitives that we offer from, from the micro VM. And data abstractions, what does an object look like, how is it laid out, not our business, we'll give you something that you can allocate in a heap 
a garbage collected heap, but uh, you can lay out the objects the way you like. You can lay out your, your uh, virtual method dispatch tables however you like. You can do all sorts of things with respect to the way you lock those objects, how you represent the synchronization states for those objects. And there will probably be even client JITs that will sit above this level which will perform the task of dealing with language specific sorts of dynamic optimizations that you might want to apply given your particular language and the semantics of your programming language. We're not going to provide those. It's a very low level, intended to be a very small, uh, compact, but hopefully performant uh, virtual machine. Very small, low level, a substrate for language implementation, uh, and we also have this other goal of having something that is so is not so big that we cannot formally specify it and verify it. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the group that we're affiliated with at NICTA is the team that uh, spent on the order of 20 man years to verify the SEL4 microkernel operating system. And they're very keen to have a uh, application and a runtime environment sitting above their microkernel for programming uh, these sorts of managed languages. Uh, so that's, that's their interest in, in our work. And we just have these three abstractions. Memory, concurrency, and the underlying abstraction of the architecture of the machine. Okay. We're going to provide you with an instruction set which is quite low level but uh, does not yet get to the level of the machine architecture. Yes, Richard. Yes. I don't know. What are you going to say? Your aim is to make it very small. Now, look at your previous picture um, of your microkernel architecture. It's a bit intersect handed to do. My abstract style here very clearly separates say, the PC from the rest of the virtual machine, including the object. Which picture are you talking about? This one? Yeah, the one on the right. Yeah. No, we're all down here. So that your, your layer doesn't look that thin. And secondly, I, I mean, should some of the DC parts be above? Well, that's, that's the, the, the issue we face, of course, is that a good garbage collector is going to interact with both the compiler, the JIT, and concurrency, because you're going to have parallel and concurrent garbage collection, you would hope, right? And those, those interactions tend to be quite uh, intertwined. They can't, they're not really separable. Um, now, with respect, to, with respect to Jikes and its garbage collector, it's a, it's a, the MMTK is a toolkit, right? It's an entire framework for building lots of different sorts of garbage collectors. We have no intention of providing that sort of framework. We will provide a garbage collector or a range of garbage collectors that will operate at this level. Well, that's not one of our goals, but it's an interesting question. Could be a, GC, a PhD thesis for someone sitting in this room. Okay. And in comparison, we compare this to, you know, to LLVM, which itself is very small. It doesn't have any heavy... Uh, sorry, sorry. In comparison to LLVM, we will be very small, and we will not have these heavyweight optimizations that LLVM actually happens to do. So if you want to have heavier weight optimizations, they have to happen outside of the micro V and above, above our um, abstraction layer. We do have this goal of targeting managed languages, languages that are dynamic, that are, are continuously refining and adapting the code that they're executing, and of course garbage collectors. And with a concurrency and threading model that is sufficiently flexible for you to build different threading abstractions and synchronization abstractions, but with uh, primitives that we think we can support efficiently. Um, and in contrast with the JVM, again, we're very small. We don't have these heavyweight optimizations. Uh, it's, again, a much lower level of abstraction, more on the order of the abstraction level of LLVM, although we're slightly raised above that because we do have to have semantics for heap and reachability and references. Um, and then uh, we ha have, have adopted uh, pretty much the same approach as LLVM with respect to the intermediate uh, instructions and use of an SSA form uh, for much the same reason that we think that we can utilize that for more efficient or quicker code, code generation. So what's the challenge? Well, the challenge that we've faced so far, and we've spent a lot of time 
at the beginning here trying to get the abstraction right. So we've been looking at lots of different programming languages. Python, PyPy is one of them. Um, uh, we've looked at Haskell. Uh, we've looked at C. Uh, we've looked at Java. Um, as to what is needed to get the abstractions right to support a wide range of languages um, while keeping it simple, but also giving us the opportunity to have performance. We want when you say performance, so there's this there's this folklore, right? What are the optimizations that matter? I think there was a paper by Amir Diwan of uh, uh, several uh, maybe a decade or so ago. Um, do you recall the paper? No. So he took and examined the impact of various optimizations. I believe it was in GCC. And um, what is the most, well, maybe it was Jake IBM, was it Richard Jake IBM that he did this with respect? I can't remember, it's been a long time. But the conclusion was that there are two optimizations that count, inlining and register allocation. And everything else is just gravy, barely, barely worth, not necessarily even worth the, worth the implementation effort. Right? Why inlining? Because it gives you context for register allocation. And you do a good job of register allocation, you're avoiding memory. Okay. Um, I, I thought that was his work. More recent, I look at performance or for energy. Ah, right. Okay. All right. So, so, so it's a good question, though. With respect to performance, what do we mean? I think we're talking about you know, some level of inlining so that we can get good context for register allocation, presumably instruction selection, and maybe a little scheduling. If you want, if you want the performance that you get from the optimizations you have with Java, with um, you know uh, speculation on types and things, then you're going to you're going to have to implement those, continue to implement those above the VM. But again, the, the point we're, we're we're trying to be language agnostic, and so we didn't want to buy into any particular model there. Um, okay, so, but we do want support for languages to build their own speculative optimizations and to be able to do things like OSR, so we have to have primitives that will support that, um, as well as having concurrency abstractions that we think they can use to build whatever synchronization constructs they might have, whether it's Java monitors, you know, with, with uh, state in the objects and so on, uh, or off in the inside objects and things. Um, the other thing is this portability, getting portability right. What should we expose to uh, the client languages you know, with respect to the underlying hardware, un endianness or word width and so on? Uh, and with respect to endianness, we've pretty much gone with little endian because that's the state of the world these days. Uh, but you know, there's questions of how much of exposure of word width do we give? Um, how much do we let the client know what the native word size happens to be and so on? And then what underlying hardware features we want to support, like SIMD or hardware transactional memory and so on. And we do have some thoughts on how to do some of that as well. All right, I'm going to, uh, before I go into some details, I just want to point out that this is uh, ongoing. It's, uh, there's a website you can go to, microbem.org, where you can read our specification. Uh, you can see our reference implementation. Um, and uh, there's various tutorial informa information there as well. Um, a bunch, an issue tracker, if, if, if you end up using our stuff, we'd be happy to hear from you and you can lodge issues there as well. Um, what's the specification have in it? Um, I'll dive a little deeper on some of these shortly, but um, there's you know, questions of what does the actual instruction set look like? What's the type system? Um, what's the client interface? So one of the things that's important about this virtual machine is that we expect that clients are going to be sitting on the side interacting with the virtual machine as it runs to uh, optimize, re-optimize, de-optimize, uh, and provide us with updates to code that, that they want to have executed. Um, and so we have an API that allows the client side to talk to the, uh, the virtual machine. Um, we have model of thread and stacks. We actually have an ob abstract model for threads and stacks. So you can, in fact, inspect the abstract state of the virtual machine on the side. Um, and in fact, mutate that state as necessary. Um, and then, you know, what does memory look like and so on. The other thing I should say is that we have this goal of ver formal verification. So we are building a formal spec for the micro VM that we hope to be able to use to 
uh, verify aspects of its implementation so that we know what the VM is supposed to be doing and show that our, our implementations actually do that. Um, and this actual this goal has influenced much of the design and our goals of, uh, of, of simplicity and clarity so that we can understand it in a formal sense. Um, the other goal there, of course, with formal, uh, a formal spec is that it allows clients then to reason about their use of the virtual machine and the semantics of the programs that they're delivering to us. Um, so it gives them a basis on which to perhaps build trusted uh, software above us. Yes? Yes. Um, we have we reserve the right to have portions of the spec undefined, effectively implementation defined. Um, yes, we need for. Um, we well, so if we layer this above SEL four, we get some of those uh, guarantees. Um, and then we also need to understand the architecture that we're targeting. Um, one of the things that we're really grappling with at the moment is how do we manage a modularization of the formal spec with respect to the underlying memory model of the hardware that we're targeting. Um, and we've tried to separate those in the formal spec. Um, at this point in time, I don't think that, that the, uh, the formal specs for these target architectures are really quite there yet for us to use. X86 we probably can do reasonably easily, but ARM's a little harder. Well, so it's, it ultimately comes down to what can we operationalize in our specification of the underlying machine. Um, ben? So without these undefined parts of the spec... You're still worried about undefinedness, yeah. yeah so Certainly, this, that's what the C spec says that you should believe, right? But is that what actually people do in practice? So and, what and compilers do is when the evil is when they detect that you're unconditionally doing the undefined behavior, they may delete your program because you're not. That's not supposed to ever happen. Yep. Yep. But on the other hand, people also do tend to rely on particular C compilers, C compilers having particular behaviors. Yeah. And actually, there's a great paper at PLDI this year, next week. Um, that actually looks at the disconnect between the spec and what compiler writers and what programmers understand with respect to the C semantics. Yes. So, so there's a difference between implementation defined behavior and C mm -hmm. undefined behavior. Implementation defined means that it wasn't supposed to look for it. Undefined so, means bad. And you should know that. So the usual, the usual strategy for these undefined portions of things, if you're worried about native, or at least, sorry, un unsafe features, right? Uh, at that point, you're reliant on some external guarantee for what that unsafe operation is doing. So it's not that we, it's not that we are, are going to say that it's necessarily undefined. Well, it would be undefined in our spec, but with, with respect to a particular implementation, you could perhaps reason about it. As, as, as long as you can provide assertions as to what that operation will actually well, do. So it sets up a contrast, right? So can, yeah. can, can an optimizer assume that a program that executes undefined behavior is incorrect and can, for example, do what C does and actually go back in time to the beginning of the execution and evaluate under memory. Is that cool? I, I don't think we would like that, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, so certainly there are corners of the spec that we have to be careful of, but with respect to the VM itself, we want to actually have a, a, a well-defined semantics. Um, but even within the spec itself, there are undefined Portions. There'll, there'll be portions of the spec that say, if you do this, it's undefined. Like, use something with the wrong type, for example. Okay. Not, not, you, you, we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what's the status? Um, we actually have uh, a full spec, um, and our formal spec is ongoing right now. Uh, there's a bit of dialogue back and forth. It's actually very interesting. Dialogue back and forth between the formalization group and the original design group as to, well, is this really the way we wanted to express it in the original, in the, in the uh, reference specification? And um, uh, so this, it's interesting, the dialogue that goes back and forth there. And it's resulted, I think, in some clarification of our uh, original specification. We do have a full reference implementation. Uh, it's implemented in Scala. 
Um, so obviously we're not promising much in the way of performance, but it does provide implementation of the specification. And we have this performance implementation underway. We, are, we already have done a prototype which we've now used as for experience and have thrown away. Uh, and we're implementing in Rust, which has been interesting. Um, we have started out by prototyping a um, relatively high performance concurrent garbage collector, actually parallel garbage collector in Rust, not concurrent, um, but making use of the concurrency features of Rust, which has been interesting to us. One of the downfalls of Rust is that Rust is a language that doesn't actually have a very good spec. Um, and at some point we're going to have to bite the bullet and ask whether that's really the place we want to be, excepting that it does enforce some programming disciplines that we think are actually very useful um, with respect to aliasing and sharing uh, in concurrent settings. So um, we have a paper coming up next uh, couple of weeks on that, that if you want to read the details. Um, and we in, uh, have also been exploring a number of language bindings. Um, we've uh, started out with looking at a bit of Haskell. Um, we're uh, looking at GHC. Uh, have had some dialogue with Simon Marlowe about how we can rip out the guts of their LLVM-based uh, compiler and uh, see if we can't uh, shoehorn in translation to Mu. Um, some interesting things there, of course, are that um, they have their own runtime system implemented in C, um, and we want to rip that out and replace it with our own, so there's lots of stuff that will get thrown away there. Um, we're also working um, on R Python, um, so we're hoping to eventually get into the PyPy ecosystem. Um, as of a few weeks ago, we have uh, the SOM interpreter from PyPy running on uh, interpreted uh, on Mu, um, and then the, the team at UMass is working on the JIT backend for PyPy to retarget it to Mu. Um, and that, way, that will give us access to a large swath of, of, of the languages that happen to be supported in the PyPy ecosystem as well. Um, should add, there's some work on Java to Mu and some work on um, a C to Mu compiler. Um, and you might say, why? Uh, well, it's because we want to be able to compile libraries that might have been implemented in C. All right, so. Now I get to dive a little deeper and just give you a sense of what's actually in the VM and what it looks like. Um, and so here's a, a fragment of code for factorial. That's the, the, the grunge that looks like in textual form. Um, this is not the form that we expect programs to, to, to be delivered to us, but it's the form that you can dump and, and uh, inspect. Um, and I'll d describe some of the details of this shortly. Uh, but uh, you'll notice that there are types, types for the, the, the VM um, that we can have uh, flows, uh, that the flows themselves are annotated by their, the values that are passed along those flow edges. Um, and so you'll see uh, names given with types for the values that are received at a particular label in the program. Um, and uh, function call, usual sorts of things. And I'll, I'll go through into this into some detail in just a minute. Um, with respect to types, well, we've got the usual primitive types, um, in float double, functions, um, unsigned pointer types. This is our uh, interfa interface to the native uh, world of C. Um, vector type, uh, structs. Interestingly, we have this, this hybrid struct thing. If any of you are Smalltalk programmers, you might remember the Smalltalk uh, objects have a, a fixed part and a variable part. That's exactly what that is. Um, there's various use cases for that for different languages. Um, arrays. And then we have these uh, heap references. We have references, references to, the, to objects the, as they exist in the heap. What we call internal references, references to the interior guts of objects in the heap so that you can build up and dereference into, uh, into objects in the heap. And those, those are first class values. You can hold them elsewhere in the programs. Um, function references, some abstractions over stack and threads, and I'll talk a little bit about those abstractions shortly, stack references and thread references. Um, note, of course, that C has no ref type, so in, in, with respect to what's, what LLVM supports, we have this whole space of, of uh, references that we can use with respect to uh, the heap and garbage collection. Uh, in the micro VM, threads and stacks are distinct abstractions. So threads can actually swap stacks uh, with an instruction. So 
So the swap stack instruction will take us to a new stack from the current stack, and there is an opportunity to receive back values when we get swapped back to, so the type of the return value, as well as to pass values to the thing that we're swapping to. And the swap, uh, the, the swap E, the swap, the swap E. <laughs> so the receiver of those values has to be added well-defined uh, label in, its, uh, in the function that we're swapping it into uh, to resume execution with, and the signature has to match this, um, this uh, what we're passing as arguments. Um, this is sufficient that we, we believe this is sufficient to build a number of abstractions, continuations, and coroutines, or even lightweight green style threading, if you like, on top of uh, the, the VM threads that we'll provide. Um, threads themselves can trap, so there's a trap instruction, which is how you get back out of the executing code to the client. So the client will receive at that point a, uh, a frozen thread state with stack state that it can inspect and manipulate and then choose either to resume, in which case the, the resumption of the trap will have a return value, or to throw an exception to cause the, uh, the function, sorry, to cause the, uh, re oh, upon return, to cause transfer of control to this exception label. All right, so that it gives you a way of escaping at those trap points. Um, sort of usual things we have to say what needs to be in the set of live variables that can be inspected by the client at that point should a trap occur. So there are these keep alive uh, things that we have in the flow um, so that you know exactly what you can refer to. Um, we also have what we call watch points. So you can enable a watch point. A watch point sits there and, and does effectively as a no-op uh, until enabled. When I enable watch point 42, that's going to cause this instruction effectively to trap uh, to the client, at which point there are various options uh, that can occur again with respect to resumption. We have this introspection API for stacks. So this is now the client side is wanting to inspect the state of a, of a frozen thread effectively. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things you can ask is what's the top frame on a stack? And then you can walk your, walk your way down the stack over the frames of that stack to get the next frame and so on down the stack. Um, you can get yourself a new stack. You can construct a new, a new stack, which is going to, uh, when resumed, will uh, execute from this function f. Uh, with whatever arguments are provided to that function. Uh, enabling of watch points, asking what the current function is, what the current instruction is. And then this is the machinery we have for doing OSR. So I can take a, a, a stack state and I can pop some number of frames from the top of that stack and then replace frames on the top of the stack as necessary to get a resumption point for execution. Um, and we believe that that should be sufficient for us to do the OSR style operations, uh, optimizations that uh, we're used to seeing in uh, dynamic languages. Um, so OSR and guards, so a trap instruction can be the way in which you trigger if you've got some condition that fails in your program that you can trigger a trap to come back out and then reconsider what the situation should be in terms of execution and whether additional code needs to be injected into the program. Um, as well as dynamic optimizations. So uh, this, you know, that's, again, being able to, based on profiling, uh, rejig your programs. Yes? Can you talk about a security model to control what you do to stacks? A security model to control? Whether you can or cannot use stacks. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. If you think that that would be useful, we should talk. <laughs> Um, so we, we, we did not put security as one of our goals. Okay. But I can understand your, your, your concerns because there are many exploits that, that rely on the ability to mutate stacks. Right? Um, with respect to atomics and synchronization, we have been a little gutless in this respect. Um, because it's not clear that there's anything better out there than just giving uh, compilers that target us um, full slather at the underlying machine primitives. Um, so we have C11 style or C++11 style atomic uh, uh, instructions and types, um, very similar to what's provided by LLVM. We're also providing a Futex construct which can be useful uh, for building uh, synchronization mechanisms for uh, thread systems and uh, synchronization constructs like those in Java, for example. 
Um, so those are the basis for our, our client level synchronization abstractions. Um, there's the unsafe native interface that we have for interfacing with the C world or equivalent um, with unsigned pointers, uh, sorry, untraced pointers, pointers that, that don't refer into the heap and similarly untraced function pointers. And finally, I'm not going to use my full hour and a half, I'm going to only go an hour. Um, we're also working on some other aspects of this design, um, partly because I have worked on transactional memory previously, uh, and Elliot and I have this interest in providing some support for transactional memory in the virtual machine. Um, the question then is, how do you expose uh, transactional memory primitives that can be effectively implemented on the target hardware architecture for transactions. So we'd like to be able to have abstractions at the VM level that have efficient implementation in hardware transactional memory. Um, and so we're, we'd like to exploit best effort hard HTM where possible. Um, and we've come up with a model of, of abstract logging of values, if you like, and rollback, rollback of, of state uh, based on the logging of those values where some of those operations can be optimized away if we can get underlying hardware transactional memory support. So that certain logging operations do not need to take place in, the, in, in settings where we know that the HTM can actually do the logging and rollback for us. Uh, so neither the logging nor the rollback would take place if we had HTM support for that. Um, uh, if you're interested in some of the directions that we've gone with some of this work, um, we have a paper that we hope will appear at Uppsala this year on um, using hardware transactional memory alongside of software transactional memory in a hybrid way, um, which has turned out to be uh, quite uh, productive. And then I mentioned this formalization effort, which is in HOL4. HOL4 is one of these uh, uh, logic dialects that are used in the verification space. Michael Norris is the maintainer of HOL4, which is why it happens to be that we're working in HOL4. Uh, that's probably the only reason other than that he's very familiar with it. Um, and that's going to be the basis for our verification story uh, when we get to it, alongside client semantics that uh, clients can rely upon uh, to reason about programs that are running on, on mute. And so that's where I'll stop at this point. <laughs>